Last video, I committed a mistake, uh, which a nice commenter made me aware of. The quote about thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, well, that's not actually quite what Hegel said. Instead, he refers to the motor of the dialectical process as uh, sublation. The German Aufheben, to sublate in English, has a twofold meaning in the language. It equally means to keep, to preserve, and to cause to cease, to put an end to. Even to preserve already includes a negative note, namely that something, in order to be retained, is removed from its immediacy, and hence from an existence which is open to external influences. That which is sublated is thus something at the same time preserved, something that has lost its immediacy but has not come to nothing for that. In a, in a funny way, in the new introduction to the sublime object of ideology, Slavoj Žižek describes the process of sublation something similar to eating, digesting and, well, defecating. When you sublate something, you digest and take in a core part of it. Something is retained, something is preserved. But at the same time, you shed, well, the, the leftovers, the feces, you know. Instead of a collapsing tree graph towards truth, like the initial framing I had chosen to use indicated, it is much more complicated and nuanced. But I realized that functionally my argument of the last episode stays the same, even if we change to this terminology. Though if you ever go into studying this stuff for yourself, I don't want you to come away with the same wrong preconceptions I had from my research. This mistake seems to be very common in almost any source that explains Hegel's ideas. Last time we have dealt with a philosophical lens, focused very much on a broader societal level of Evangelion's instrumentality and Shinji's rejection of it. We have examined Hegel's world spirit and the idea of the end of history in contrast with the unique that is rising up against it, and does not allow the idea of a larger universality to be its cause. But it would be very reductive to ignore the personal, more psychological dimension. The unique might be an interesting figure in the way he rejects any societal narrative around him, but it would also be highly interesting to explore the psychological dimensions that make us desire instrumentality in the first place. We can find something that can help us understand this in the works of Sigmund Freud and particularly in his ideas about death drive. Last episode I teased I would include Camus into this, but writing the script I realized that this would go on for far too long, so instead enjoy the psychoanalytical reading for now and the series has officially been expanded into four parts and more to come honestly because I've really opened the box of Pandora here. In Freudian psychoanalysis there's two opposed drives at the core of the psyche the pleasure principle and the death drive. The pleasure principle is straightforward enough. It is the will to live, the desire to create. It is something constructive, well and so on. And since in Freudian analysis everything manifests in some form unconsciously, for example in dreams, so does the pleasure principle. And his initial claim in his early work was that in every dream at the core there is the fulfillment of a wish. Pleasure. Freud argues, comes from resolving tension. Tensions build up, maybe through anticipation, maybe through strife, maybe through struggle, and are released in the form of pleasure once the object of desire is attained. But death drive isn't that easy. Fortunately, Evangelion offers us a fantastic example of it in action. The concept itself arose from a puzzling experience Freud describes in Beyond the Pleasure Principle. That some people, despite their basic desire to avoid unpleasurable experiences, repeatedly exposed themselves to their trauma or were exposed to it. For instance, a soldier with a war trauma repeatedly re-encountering his trauma in dreams. But also a child who in play restaged the disappearance of his mother. Or patients in Freud's clinic who instead of treating painful experiences as memories, repeatedly relived them. 
What he saw there was a sort of compulsion to repeat. Something so primal that it overrides the pleasure principle, which he previously assumed to be the main psychological drive. After a while of deliberation, he came to the conclusion that this is indicative of an urge in organic life to restore an earlier state of things. And building up on this idea, the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan developed it further. It's not grounded in biology, but it's a repetition automatism or repetition compulsion. He urges us to not simply read Death Drive with a wish for suicide, a wish to end one's own life and return to an inorganic matter state. No, instead much more subtle, as Slavoj Žižek points out to us. The Freudian Death Drive has nothing whatsoever to do with the craving for self-annihilation, for the return to the inorganic absence of any life tension. It is on the contrary, the very opposite of dying, a name for the undead eternal life itself. For the horrible fate of being caught in the endless, repetitive cycle of wandering around in guilt and pain. The paradox of the Freudian death drive is therefore that it is Freud's name for its very opposite, for the way immortality appears within psychoanalysis, for an uncanny excess of life for an undead urge which persists beyond the biological cycle of life and death. This example where he calls it undead is a very interesting one that I want to elaborate on some more. The death drive is not a desire towards death, but a desire towards the kinds of safe repetitions of already experienced elements of life that we have already learned to cope with. It is to not continue life, but without actually dying. The negation of death is not life, but undead. We can immediately conjure up in our minds the zombie or the vampire, who should be dead but refuse to die. Eternally stuck in their cycles of sucking blood and eating the living. They aren't dead, but they also aren't alive. They exist in a position of constant repetition, of pure consumptive behavior. Death Drive is, for example, wanting to lock yourself up in your room, listening to one song over and over while staring at the ceiling. Death Drive isn't to get rid of the tensions that are required to achieve pleasure, but to withdraw from them in perpetual guilt and agony. Still wanting to partake in that pleasure, which paradoxically causes cycles of guilt, pain and isolation in the first place. It is the very hedgehog's dilemma that is explained in Evangelion as the principle that people cannot get too close to each other because they would hurt each other, but if they aren't getting close, they will be cold and isolated. But instead of it being about Shinji and another person, this really goes deeper. It is about the fundamental reality that life is hard, sometimes unbearably so. That getting close to life means experiencing pain and trauma, hurt, anxiety, but withdrawing from it means guilt, isolation, Loneliness. Lacan provides an interesting lens to look at this. He reinterpreted the Freudian superego, the judging moral conscience in your ego, that always evaluates your actions according to your moral principles, as a much more sinister and almost cruel function. The superego that urges you to desire, to seek pleasure, and that makes you feel guilt for not doing so. This is the guilt of not partaking in potential pleasures that the superego imposes on people, according to Lacan. This is an idea that allows us to completely turn our understanding of instrumentality on its head. While through Hegel we had the idea of universality and progress embodied in instrumentality, now we have the same thing be a painfully direct embodiment of death drive. Think about it. Shinji's first experience of being LCL, or instrumental, was being trapped in Eva Unit 1 possessed by the soul or essence of his mother, stuck in its womb, and withdrawal, dissolved. This is akin to the Freudian idea of regression, where the subject due to dealing with trauma or due to withdrawal from trauma regressed back to a previous developmental stage. Shinji curls up into a fetus position and becomes one again with the safety of his mother's womb. Similarly to the idea of the negation of death in Undead, we see a negation of being born into well, being unborn. In a return to the womb as someone who lives, who should not be in the womb, but is. And withdraws into it. So there's already the association of being dissolved in LCL's withdrawal. Of entering a state prior to being a self, a responsible individual. Of having to deal with people. 
the simple warmth and safety of the mother. She was the absence in Shinji's life. The love Shinji never receives, instead being stuck with a father who didn't know how to love. His fundamental lack and trauma is the absence of parental figures who love him. His regression to the womb is to recall his connection to his mother. The time before the cold reality of neglect and abandonment and hurt was imposed on him. Ultimately, he desires instrumentality because it can free him of his burden. Uh, so he believes. But it wouldn't really free him of it. Even in that state, there's a guilt that comes from repressing the reality that he is in fact withdrawing from reality. That he is neglecting his duties. That he is betraying people. That he is fleeing from life by floating around into safe and comfortable everlasting repetition that now characterizes his existence. And what about Gendo? Isn't he doing the same? Isn't his taking control of Rei a clone of his late wife Yui, and his desire to bring about instrumentality and join into one big fantasy with all other people and his deceased wife, a desire of him to return to the previous stages of life, to restore the time in which maybe even he was happy, a time of organic community where the social fabric wasn't yet disrupted by catastrophe and world-ending disaster, to endlessly avert death and repeat the same stable reality forevermore. But even further, isn't that everyone who gets hurt? Doesn't everyone wish to withdraw from the pain, suffering, loss and guilt sometime in their life? Return to the protected safety of the past and childhood? A safety which in itself is marked by the same principle of repetition, by the same principle of repression. Without wanting to put too much emphasis on a Lacanian reading, which should really be its own video entirely, I want to highlight a specific scene here that can help us understand it in context. Lacan sees as a fundamental operation of the unconscious that we come up with fantasies to paint over gaps and things we lack in reality, explaining them away with a fantasy or even completely ignoring them through hiding behind a protective screen of fantasy. This is brought to a very visceral climax in Evangelion when in episode 26 we can see the fantasy inside the instrumentality. Shinji, living with his family, happily acting out a typical otaku rom-com high school slice of life show with the others. Everything is fake and tropey. Otakudom and fandom as an escape from reality. As a phantasmatic illusion to escape the realities and hardships of living. Alienation in its highest form is this highly dissociated attempt to assemble the vision of a functioning reality through the use of safe tropes and fictions. And I really want to go a lot more into this at some point, so I'll just tease here that I might deliver a generalized Lacanian reading of Otaku Escapism at some point in the future, uh, after I've read a lot more Lacan. Instrumentality can offer us safety from pain, loss and guilt. Instrumentality is also immortality, in the endless repetition and the lack of division, in the absolute withdrawal from all human constructs and human difference with the abolishment of the AT fields, there's only one primordial repetition. A bizarre Hegelian universality of world spirit that is far from what he might have imagined. Instead of ideas negating and sublating each other to come to universal truths, the universal truth seems to be within this repetition drive of avoidance and a desire to become unborn by regressing. Imagine a world of depression, you know, like in the worst depressive episodes where you withdraw into your room. Think for example of Welcome to the NHK, wasting away day by day, avoiding all responsibility, plagued by guilt and anxiety, curling up into a ball of vulnerability. To me, this is very much like instrumentality. The rejection of all the difficult parts of human interaction by desiring a world where everyone is unborn. Think of Shinji sitting in the train listening to the one song over and over again. Repetition over and over again. Repetition and withdrawal. When we are all one, there's no difference anymore. Everything will be one substance of sameness, of repetition. No boundaries. No pain, no hurt, just withdrawal. The will to be a self comes with the burden of resisting this death drive. 
The only way any of us can live at all is to will ourselves out of it. But why? What's the point? And how would we even do it? First, let me follow Shinji a bit longer. Shinji never dealt properly with the lack of a mother. He repressed it. But it is still real. First scene in I don't want to pilot the Ava. Read, mother. Second in finding comfort in the Ava. Dissolve this LCL. Reconnecting with his mother, and then the everlasting repetition and withdrawal that is instrumentality itself. More indications of Shinji dealing with his repressed desire for motherly affection is in Rei. Rei is a clone of Shinji's mother, and she gets a lot of affection from Gendo. Shinji mainly uses Rei as a proxy for his desire of recognition by his father. But Gendo is able to violently take away this connection Shinji made to her. The Rei he had connected to disappears and is replaced by Rei 3, who doesn't remember the deeper connection to him. This is an Oedipal struggle with the father over the affection of the mother. The Freudian idea of the Oedipal phase is too complex to explain it fully, but the brief version is that it is the phase of a child's psychological development, where they learn the order of the world and about morality and their place in it under authorities. By recognizing that their father has the primary right for the motherly love, they learn their place below the father and in duty to the father's power. Rei functions as a proxy for dealing with this, but Shinji isn't that fired. We can see him repeatedly not having any sense of duty, rather just a desire for recognition as his main drive. He hasn't acknowledged fatherly power and his role in it, but merely his desire for being loved. This is why he pilots Eva at first. What happens in the state of human instrumentality is that Shinji encounters his mother, who helps him give himself a will to live and to decide to leave it. But is this just it? You need the magical mystical fanta soup to conjure up your dead parents and they tell you to get good and you simply do? No, this is far more complex. Instrumentality of course doesn't literally confront Shinji with his mother. It's unconscious. The entire soup of instrumentality is a blending of all unconscious minds into one, and his mother is a fantasy he himself conjures up for himself. In a typical psychoanalytical regression, he regresses to re-experience the love of his mother that was deeply buried in his unconscious early childhood memories and deals with them. Trauma is the excess that our conscious mind can't deal with and thus needs to repress, which leads to the death drive, the painful repetition loop. But what also lies dormant within us there is the pleasure principle. The will to live. Here embodied through Shinji's mother who wants him to live. He recognizes in her wish, her primordial love, that he is in fact desired and can in himself find a wish to live. The finale when Shinji regains his self is him dealing with the trauma of the absent mother and leaving the patriarchal Oedipus complex behind. He is still fully subjected to the Oedipal struggles up until that point, but then refuses to let it keep defining himself. Despite his past and his trauma, he can become. Surprising credence to my theories here are afforded by the fact that Arno himself consciously put references to Freud's work into Evangelion. The episode titles of the two episodes focusing on Shinji's assimilation into the LCL inside of Ava Unit 1 had the subtitles Introjection and Weaving a Story 2, Oral Stage, which are both direct references to Freud and psychoanalysis. Introjection is a complicated idea that refers to the process by which a person may incorporate things, patterns, behaviors from the external world into themselves as a defense mechanism. In Mourning and Melancholia, Freud traces the link between ambivalent feelings of melancholia towards a deceased person and an introjection. Melancholia, according to Freud, is different from simple mourning because of the fact that the feelings towards the lost person are ambivalent, not simply positive, but a mixture of love and hate love towards the mother Shinji desires, and hate towards the mother that left him alone. What this leads to, according to Freud, is a profoundly painful dejection, cessation of interest in the outside world, a loss of the capacity to love, inhibition of all activity, and the lowering of the self-regarding feelings to a degree that finds utterance in self-reproaches and self-revilings, and culminated in a delusional expectation of punishment. All in an act to free themselves of the guilt felt because of their feelings. And aren't most of those statements things we can witness Shinji directly exhibiting? 
Introjection then is characterized as the extreme identification, including a loss of self, where the ego metaphorically devours the lost object of desire. Shinji dissolves into LCL, becoming one with the psyche in a regression, becoming one with the supposed essence of soul of his mother. Now we can neatly fit the oral stage into this explanation as well. The oral stage during psychosexual development of children is the first phase where a young child is still being breastfed by the mother, where the child's world consists only of immediate desire for warmth and food, and of the satisfaction of the mother providing it. A phase, by the way, closely linked to a high potential for depression if childcare during this phase is neglected and the kid does learn a sort of fundamental primordial trust in the world during this phase. And in light of Shinji's relationship to his mother, it makes sense that this would be the phase he regresses to, as it is the phase where he would be most closely linked to and in the care of his mother. So I talked a lot about the ending and how it is specifically related to Shinji's psyche, but isn't instrumentality universal? Isn't everyone joined in this soup? See, this is where I find some of the genius in Evangelion. Is it really so? How is it that our only focal point is Shinji? Everything we experience in instrumentality is always pivoting around Shinji. The fantasy of this shallow high school life comedy anime is conjured up from Shinji's wish for an easier story, one of sameness of safe tropes and safe repetitions, very much along the lines of how this drawing otaku, deeply driven by the death drive, would spend his days watching mindless recycled trope laden anime like that, which would provide nothing but an escape from the fact that this safe, easy, happy, simple fantasy is not their own reality. But also the discussion of who perceives whom and in what way is all around Shinji. The whole spiel about the Asuka in your mind and so on. Shinji is working through his trauma, similar to Freud's understanding of the symptom as doing work for us in our unconscious, that it deals with something for us, that we work through the symptom. Since we never see another perspective, why would you not just assume that this instrumentality is just putting Shinji deep into his own psyche? Where is the mixing with others, other than that we can conclude that Asuka knows what Shinji did and felt after she re-emerges as well? This all aligns with Evangelion's metaphorical structure. Evangelion represents individual trauma as societal trauma. It extrapolates Shinji's psyche onto the world. In Pause and Select's video on Evangelion as part of the Understanding Disaster series, he links this perfectly into the genre of Sekaike, a sort of withdrawal fiction. I highly recommend checking out this video to augment my points here. Shinji's dealing with his trauma is mirrored on the unconscious of the entire world. His universal psychological struggle is emblematic of the times, the falling apart of paternal power, the absence of motherly love. What Shinji's introspective psychoanalytical regression is, is at the same time the regression of the entire world, culture and society. Alright, I talked about how Shinji dealt with trauma and found a conviction to live, but it was really also abstract, so unconscious, and it didn't answer the broader point of the why at all. Where can we find meaning if everything is so painful, nihilistic, so absurd? Well, let's explore this idea of generating such a meaning that can push back against death drive, against instrumentality, against depression, against meaninglessness in the next episode through the ideas of Sören Kierkegaard and Albert Camus.